Hi everyone. I hope you're having a nice week and not watching too much YouTube for reasons that will be clear by the end of this video. If you don't know already what Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death is about. Postman was a cultural and media critic, and this piece he wrote in 1985, I think in response to a discussion about George Orwell's book, 1984, uh, conveys a deep unease with the way that modern increases in the sheer speed and constancy of information resulting from new forms of media, starting with the telegraph, proceeding to radio, and culminating in television. Uh, this book was written in 1985, as I said. His book is about how these developments have, in his eyes, corrupted the very way that Americans view such concepts as news, discussion, debate, and information itself. As with quite a few of the nonfiction books I read, I heard about it from the Ezra Klein show. Honestly, I think that might have given Postman a glimmer of hope about the future, if only a small glimmer, to know that there's still room in American discourse for longer podcasts like this uh, with a focused discussion. Still, though, this show might not be quite long enough or involved enough to really get at what Postman would have hoped for. Uh, this is a man who views the six-hour Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, with breaks in the middle for people to go home for dinner and then come back uh, as the pinnacle of civil discourse. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but Postman will certainly come across at times, uh, especially to modern readers, as resistant to simply inevitable developments in modern technology. Though he seems fully cognizant that he isn't going to prevent the changes he's observing, which are already well underway at the time of writing. He contents himself in this book with just letting us know what we're losing. And though I'm a bit more technologically progressive, I guess you could say, than Postman when it comes to the media, I think the sentiments he offers are worth taking seriously. I certainly think it's important to take a critical view uh, towards technological developments instead of framing the story of human science and engineering as simply one of inevitable, uh, indisputable, and singular progress towards a higher state of existence. All technologies involve change, and even if we ultimately evaluate the benefits as justifying the costs, they do have costs, and they do remove us from aspects of our former life that were arguably valuable, even as they open up uh, new opportunities. So the title, Amusing Ourselves to Death, gets straight to the point in what Postman's critique is going to be about. He laments the death of the age of print, because in his view, communication by print required arguments to be logical, to make actual propositions that could be evaluated on their rational merit, uh, rather than these sort of insinuations by juxtaposition, witty remarks without substance, or outrageous public spectacles that receive the most attention in today's media environment. Postman opens up the book by revisiting two of the most remembered dystopian novels of the 20th century, 1984 and Brave New World. He argues here and repeatedly throughout the book that Orwell's vision in 1984 of a government that had basically obtained complete control over its people by forcing conformity was insightful in describing many totalitarian regimes, but was totally off the mark in describing the U.S. Instead, he asserts that the U.S. has turned out more like Huxley's Brave New World, in which we citizens have willingly ceded control to the forces around us because they're just so entertaining and enjoyable. Maybe we subconsciously realize that all these TV commercials and heated but vapid political debates and the 24-hour news cycle are emotionally manipulating us, but the fact is they're just so amusing that it's a concession we're content to make. And Postman argues that the infiltration of entertainment into civil discourse began with Yes, the arrival of the telegraph. Uh, the telegraph allowed Americans to communicate uh, not only about matters of essential importance, as was formerly the case, but also to share every sort of decontextualized banality, such as that the Princess of England had contracted the whooping cough. And in doing so, it ushered in a new age that Postman calls the age of show business. In the age of show business, we select the media sources we digest not on the basis of relevance, uh, nor do we evaluate them for their actual merit. Instead, we place the utmost importance on entertainment value. And thus, in today's culture, for a message to be irrational or simply non-rational, such as a commercial that unsubtly implies that you'll attract the attention of many romantic admirers once you start drinking fizzy pop or whatever, this is viewed, if anything at all, as a minor flaw. But for a message to be not entertaining is the most severe of all flaws. Because in a world where there are so many sources of stimulation and messaging that really are entertaining, what use do we have for messages that don't even try to compete on that level? Postman doesn't argue that entertainment has no value whatsoever. But he does argue that it's a problem when we conflate entertainment with information without even knowing that we're doing so. And he argues that TV as a medium has pretty much no value for anything other than entertainment because its very format is simply not suited 
rational discussions. I think he supports this point quite effectively by giving examples of what, in his view, are some of the best examples of rational TV programming and showing how lacking they are compared to good old-fashioned debate in either a long-form spoken or written format. And Postman then argues that this not only has changed public discourse, it's also changed the very way we conceive of information itself. In the age of show business, we're constantly barraged with so-called information that would more aptly be called disinformation, because we're fooled into thinking it's meaningful, but it actually has no bearing on our lives or the way we make our decisions, uh, turning life into nothing more than a game of trivial pursuit in which disembodied facts are bizarrely elevated to some high status. I want to contrast this word with the way the term disinformation is often used in a 2020s context, where it often refers to intentionally false or misleading communications whose entire goal is to manipulate. We might call that misinformation to distinguish the two if we want, but what Postman calls disinformation here is simply true facts but without any context that offer us little to no value in making our decisions and therefore are just clogging up our brains. So I'm actually going to cut in right here and re-record this little section because I think it's really interesting to think about, but I kind of butchered it and got confused in my initial recording. Postman claims that a major problem with disinformation is lack of context. For example, if you can name the capital of Albania in a trivia game, but you still have no context of what life in Albania is like and can draw no connections between Albania and anything else you know about the world, then to Postman that's useless information. And I think Postman and I are pretty much on the same page here. Trivia, for its own sake, is not really useful. He actually goes a lot further than this, though, so to explore this, let's consider a situation in which I know not just the capital of Albania, but quite a bit about Albania. Let's say that I follow all the news stories about Albania, I've read about its history, and I've read interviews or even watched YouTube videos talking with people who live there. Is that information? Well, my first reaction is that, to me, it seems like it is valuable information, but Postman would say it's not, because it doesn't have any bearing on my decisions. As I thought more about where this discrepancy comes from, though, I realized that it's not actually quite as clear-cut a distinction as I first thought. In this example, presumably I find the information about Albania valuable because it does have some bearing on my view of the world and how I live my life, even if it's maybe more indirect of a type of information of less immediacy than when I'm walking around outside and I hear a tornado siren, which is definitely information at peak utility. It's very actionable. Certainly it's a different sort of information than, say, being able to name the four Hogwarts houses, their mascots, their colors, the heads of house, their main values, etc., all of which is also contextualized information, so it fits that criterion, but has no value really outside of its entertainment value within the world of Harry Potter. I don't think Postman would really object to my statement, though, that the information that I receive about Albania and can fit into my framework is real information. Maybe he suggests, though, that it doesn't have to be an entirely binary distinction either. Like, not everything is pure information or pure disinformation. And actually, that possibility is important because Say I go to the New York Times or Fox News or whatever your favorite news source is, and okay, actually that's not a great example either because news sources generally have a spin on them. So let, let's say you go to Reuters or, or whatever your most objective no-spin news source is and you read through all the articles there. It may not really be possible to point out one of those articles and say, look, this isn't information because it has no bearing upon my life. But I think a key point that Postman is trying to make here is that although it might not be pure disinformation, we tend to drastically overestimate its usefulness to us, and thus we sometimes feel like the need to keep up on the news. And as a result, we come to prefer to know a very little bit about a lot of topics than to know a lot about a little, which he would argue, and I'd also agree, that it's more useful to know a, a, a lot about a few topics, to an extent, of course. Uh, but maybe I should just move on at this point, because this argument probably has limited credibility coming from a channel advertising my eclectic reading. Towards the end of the book in particular, Postman harnesses this critique of decontextualized information as entertainment uh, to take on the formal and informal education systems, which are also in his time learning the importance of entertainment value. Postman fears that shows like Sesame Street are corrupting Americans and other societies' very concepts of education. Yes, I'll repeat that one more time. Postman fears that Sesame Street is corrupting the youth, as it implies that education is best achieved by cramming a bunch of disjointed facts into viewers' heads, rather than teaching children and the rest of us to value the process of learning and education. 
For an example from my own education, Postman would see no value for students in learning a memorable song listing the 50 US states in order because while the end result of learning and performing this song is indeed that uh, students can now name all 50 US states, although they have to go through a song to get to the later ones, they still have no idea where Indiana is on a map, whether Wyoming or Indiana became a state first, or what controversies or even wars might have been involved in the eventual addition of Indiana to the Union as the 18th state. And yes, at risk of sounding too much like Postman myself now, uh, it is a sad fact how many of my peers uh, that grew up on the West or East Coast can name Indiana and Idaho because of the song, of course, but the two states occupy pretty much the same space geographically and conceptually in their minds. Only Illinois comes between them alphabetically. And okay, I'm mostly just ragging on my friends and maybe some of you viewers too, because these people I refer to are by and large great people, and there are a lot of worse flaws than not being able to locate Indiana, the crossroads of America, on a map anywhere within 2,000 miles of its true location. I mean, I only learned where the states were located by doing a jigsaw-type puzzle, and it is admittedly easier for me to find value in knowing where Indiana is, since it's actually where I'm from, and the other states, since I've at least briefly visited or driven through most of them. But I'm also just making the point that it's one thing for me to say, you know what, I can't label all the provinces of France on a map or even place the major cities because I never learned that. But it's rather strange that our education system has duped us into thinking we learned all the states by singing a song about them when we in fact learned nothing about them, not from the education system itself, and are now even dumber than before because now we think that we know the states. But before I dig myself into another hole here, I'll move on because Knowing the location of the states isn't even in itself important either. Because again, information is valuable within context. And education is not about learning disjointed facts, but rather about learning how to connect disjointed facts, how to select which additional facts or opinions, they don't all have to be facts, are necessary to obtain for a deeper understanding. And understanding the relevance and purpose of these broader facts for comprehending our world as a whole. Teaching students to enjoy and find motivation in an organic process of learning is hugely beneficial to our growth and future lifelong education. But teaching us that we should find the most value in whatever forms of education are most entertaining to us is, for Postman at least, but I'd mostly have to agree, is a corruption of the idea of education born of a misunderstanding of education's fundamental purposes. So was Postman right? Well, yes, on many levels, I think it's hard to argue that the dramatic changes he described in the ways Americans and really the whole world as a whole interact with media have taken place. And they had already taken place when he was writing the book, but have really only become more severe nowadays. I think his framing of the age of show business is useful for understanding the point at which we've arrived and why, for example, even though in theory I still believe that the way to choose which political candidate to vote for is to listen to a thoughtful and rational debate between the two or more candidates, watching a televised political debate nowadays is an intensely frustrating experience, and I think probably most people who've watched one in the last 10 years can agree with this, but we're still watching them, myself included. And whether we admit it or not, it's probably in large part because they're entertaining or even because we feel the need to be informed. Not, not on the actual political stances the candidates take because they don't have any, or if they do, they don't know it yet, but on the sparring that occurred. Who said what outrageous thing so that we can keep up with the next 24 hours of news and so that we don't have to feel embarrassed when our friend asks us, can you believe what he just said in the debate last night? Furthermore, although Postman vaguely foresees some cultural developments that will be ushered in by the invention of the computer, a device which in his words, not mine, is highly overrated. He probably would have been quite horrified to see where not just computers, not even just the internet, but specifically where social media has taken us to an age where 160 character tweets are not just included as part of a news story, they are the news story in themselves. The way that on most days I kind of scan through a few major news websites, and I really mean scan because on most evenings I have nothing more than a vague impression of what headlines I saw that very morning. This takes the age of show business and news as entertainment to a level even beyond what Postman foresaw in the televised news programs of the 70s and 80s. And finally, it obviously feels a little bit peculiar to be reviewing this piece in a 10 minute video on an extension of the very medium that Postman was so critical of. I think it's probably safe to say that Postman would be highly dissatisfied with YouTube as a means for meaningful cultural conversations. And one other thing that he either didn't fully foresee or just didn't include in his 1985 book was the extent to which the fragmentation of the American and global public into different groups of generally like-minded interests 
which is further described in Bill Bishop's book, The Big Sort, which I'm also going to review on this channel. How this fragmentation combined with online spaces would make it so that if you pick any two Americans at random, the amount of overlap in media they're consuming, particularly on a personalized platform such as YouTube, is incredibly small. Even if Postman might have appreciated my YouTube review of this book, first of all, he'd never have even found it. And I don't think he'd be under any illusion that this tiny subculture, that maybe 100 views this video will get in the next few years, is moving mainstream cultural conversations. And Postman will also point out to me that the very presentation of this review on the medium of YouTube changes the way in which I present it and the way in which people consume it. My videos are in some ways a little bit of an exception there because I mostly write them out ahead of time to clarify my thoughts. So they do retain a little bit of the age of print style that Postman was a fan of. But even so, the fact that I'll be presenting them in a video format in the end definitely alters the way that I write and deliver them and sometimes slightly change them on the fly. It makes them different and more informal than they'd be if I was writing an actual book or a news article or even a blog post. It's inevitable that I've sacrificed some of the rationality of a written book review for some iota of entertainment value that's needed to avoid getting effectively banned from YouTube for being boring. And beyond that, even if, let's say, instead of watching and listening to this video as a video, you just downloaded the captions and read it as text, that mode of consuming it would probably alter the way you mentally processed it and engage with it. Because our brains, at least in Postman's view, are primed to digest print media in one manner and televised or video media in another. Anyway, though, Postman would probably claim that this transformation, this injection of rationality with entertainment and emotion is pretty much just a bad thing for human rationality, but I'm not quite as convinced as he is. Televised or audio-based media, especially in candid, unscripted conversations, can actually carry a lot of nuance that isn't conveyed in pure print. It can convey the conviction or the doubt that participants have when grappling with a new or confusing idea. It can even convey the emotions the participants feel about whatever topic they're discussing. And we live in a world where people, maybe more than in the past, need to feel moved by something in order to care about it, for better or for worse. Yes, when it's all orchestrated as part of show business, it can be manipulative and misleading. But a lot of the video conversations I watch on YouTube or listen to on podcasts aren't fully orchestrated. They're simply sincere and genuine efforts to understand the world better, and their expressiveness on both an intellectual or rational level and a pure emotional level is not something that I feel misleads the viewer nearly as much as it invites the viewer into the conversation, allows them to relate to it on a little bit of a deeper level. The new power bestowed on media by audio and video recordings is a double-edged sword, and certainly as with any new technology, the edge of the sword that can be advantageously used by the people with power will be the one used most prominently in the mainstream or in massively profitable enterprises but that doesn't mean that it has no value whatsoever. So thanks for watching my review, and please go and read The Federalist Papers or some kind of work from the age of print now to cleanse your mind from this disgusting entertainment that I just subjected you to. Not Shakespeare, though. That is show business. See you next time.